Hello and welcome to Heilman and Haver, the stage and screen podcast, coming to you from Casa de Quinn and 1111 Studios in beautiful Portage, Washington. I'm Matt Haver. And I'm Greg Heilman. We're two local actors looking to hone our craft by exploring the best in local theater and on the big screen. Each week we bring you entertainment news and views, celebrate classic Hollywood, enjoy cocktails with a Tinseltown twist, interview talented local actors and directors, and chat with industry experts from L.A. to the U.K. Today is Friday, April 1st, no foolin', and welcome to episode 59. This week we welcome to the show Senior Director of Original Productions at Turner Classic Movies and author of Danger on the Silver Screen, 50 films celebrating cinema's greatest stunts, Scott McGee. He joins us in a few moments right after a look at Arts Around the Sound. Lots of stage activity happening over the next few weeks to catch you up on. Currently on stage at Seattle's A Contemporary Theater, or ACT, it's The Thin Place, a spine-tingling and mesmerizing new play by Obie Award winner Lucas Nath. The show runs through April 10th, and tickets can be had at acttheater.org. Simply told and wonderfully acted, The Thin Place draws the audience in and doesn't let go. You can find lively lines like that and the rest of Greg's review on the show on our website, heilmanandhaver.com. And while you're there, find his write-up on the musical comedy opening tonight at Bremerton Community Theater. The show follows the Bottom Brothers, Nick and Nigel, who struggle to find success in the theatrical world as they compete with the wild popularity of their contemporary, the bard himself, Bill Shakespeare. That's right, Something Rotten. It runs through May 1st, and you can find tickets and more info at bctshows.org. Something else you'll find at bctshows.org is information about auditions. Coming up Sunday and Monday, April 10 and 11. From 6 to 9 p.m., auditions will be held for the Comedy Cemetery Club, playing June 3rd through the 26th of this year, and directed by our good friend Jeffrey Bassett. The Cemetery Club is a heartwarming story about three Jewish widows coping with love, loss, and romance. The Broadway production starred Ellen Heckert as Lucille, and Cemetery Club was made into a film in 1993 starring Ellen Burstyn, Diane Ladd, and Olympia Dukakis. Well, both Greg and I have worked with Jeffrey at BCT. It's actually how we met, and can honestly say it's something every local actor should experience. As we approach our 60th episode, airing on April 15th, you can actually go back all the way to episode one and hear our interview with Jeffrey and get a great feel for his philosophy on directing and acting. Another place Matt and I frequent, both from the seat side and the stage side, is Western Washington Center for the Arts, right here in Port Orchard. Thank you to everyone who came out to see The Crucible, theater is most definitely alive again, and it felt amazing to get back on stage, for sure. We'd also like to congratulate WWCA's newly appointed acting artistic director, our friend, and another past guest, Episode 4, Rebecca Ewan, and tell you about two youth musical theater camps she'll be leading this summer. That's right, for campers age 5 through 13, it's Winnie the Pooh Kids, and for campers age 13 through 18, Legally Blonde Junior. For dates and more info, visit uh, the Classes and Workshops page at wwca.us, and their Facebook page at WWCA Theater. That's T H E A T R E, the fancy way. And of course, all these links are posted on the show notes and on our new website at HeilmanandHaver.com. As Matt mentioned earlier, we are quickly approaching episode 60. Boy, oh boy, can you believe that? And, yeah, uh, crazy. <laughs> all of our past episodes can be heard on the new website. Today, we are pleased to add Scott McGee to our growing list of talented and generous guests. Scott is Senior Director of Original Productions at Turner Classic Movies. He is also a programmer for TCM's annual film festival and the lead programmer for the TCM Classic Cruise, and has been a presenter at many of TCM's past festivals and other industry conventions. Scott's also the author of Danger on the Silver Screen, 50 films celebrating cinema's greatest stunts. His book from TCM and Running Press is a heart-racing look into the world of stunt work, featuring films that capture the exhilaration of the car chase, the comedy of a well-timed pratfall, and the adrenaline rush from a fight scene complete with reviews, behind-the-scenes stories, and literally hundreds of photographs. You can follow Scott on Twitter at at jscottmcgee and find the book on Amazon and Target.com. Scott joins us from his home in Marietta, Georgia. Scott, welcome to Heilman and Haver. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it, guys. Well, we've been, uh, we got preview copies of your book, and we've been looking forward to uh, chatting with you. And, and as we mentioned in your bio, the, the title of the book is Danger on the Silver Screen, 50 Films That Celebrate Cinema's Greatest Stunts. It's available now and focuses on an area of filmmaking that really doesn't get a lot of its due and that's or attention it deserves, and that's stunt work. So what led you to write this book on, on a topic that really doesn't get a lot of attention? Well, uh, <laughs> I, I would have to say it. It would have to go back to 1981 I, uh, when I watched uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark for the first time, the summer of 81, three times. And I just became enamored with uh, 
what this character of Indiana Jones was doing. I, I hadn't seen anything like it. And I was a boy of 10 years old. And uh, it instilled in me, uh, it just, it stirred my imagination. It's, you know, I, I, I wanted to go to the McDonald's play, playscapes and jump off the, <laughs> the sliding boards and do some, do things that only Indiana Jones could do. And I didn't know that that was stunt work, but what stunt work does to people still today is that it stirs that same, that same impulse, that same imagination. And uh, when I had the fortune of starting with TCM in, in 2000, uh, shortly after that, I had a chance to pitch some ideas for programming. And I said, it would be really great if you guys, if we did something about stunt men stunt, and stunt women. And uh, they, they agreed. And, and they, they engineered a, a three-day shoot in Los Angeles. It was my, one of my first trips uh, as a professional on a film shoot. And they corralled several uh, legends in the business, um, uh, some, many of whom have since departed. Uh, Lauren Janes, Bobby Hoy, uh, Terry Leonard, who's thankfully still with us. Uh, Rick Seaman, Jack Williams, uh, many other, Tony Brubaker, many other guys. And over the course of those three days, I just got to listen to these guys tell stories and tell, you know, their perspective of making movies. And it's not something I had ever heard before. I, you know, I'm sure some people had, but it's not something that even still today, I think a lot of people uh, get a chance to hear what these men and women do, putting their lives on the line in many cases, but doing it in a way that is that is artful and that is cinematic. These people are, they're movie makers. They are craftsmen, uh, they're artists. And I, over the course of the past 10 plus years, in, in, in starting to do research, serious research on the, on the subject. I just felt like it was something that needed to be told. It was, uh, I wanted to look at it from the viewpoint of art, of stunt work as an art and a science. And I, <laughs> I use that phrase intentionally because, <laughs> yeah. um, and, and I'm not the, I'm not the only person to say this, but but stunt work has not been given a lot of its due credit as being a, um, a legitimate art form of, of movie making. And what I, what I wanted to do is, is take a look at these films and tell the story and leave the viewer or leave the reader rather with this feeling that, you know, some of the greatest movies ever made, they're the greatest movies ever made because of the stunt work. It's interesting you mentioned Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, I think my introduction to the beauty of stunt work was when Disney MGM Studios opened in Florida, and I saw the um, was the Indiana Jones Stunt Spectacular, mm -hmm. and I hadn't realized what goes into creating these stunts. And beyond that, the stunt people who now Matt and I do uh, stage theater, and we're used to acting with you know accentuated. Um, motions and uh with with our arms and things like that and i when i watched the stunt people in, in that show i noticed the same kind of thing these people aren't just doing the stunts they're also acting you know, their faces aren't necessarily on screen but they they are doing all the things that the actors do in addition to these stunts which is pretty incredible right uh, the stunt men and the stunt women are do are they are performing a role they are performing as the actors either the lead actors or a secondary or extra they are performing a part that is what is key to understanding that when you know when these stunt professionals are going through the paces of doing a fist fight or falling out of a building or crashing a car they're not just going through the physics of the action they're doing it in a way that is contributing to the story contributing to the movie and that is what's key because as I, I i do say it in the book that there are anybody can crash a car i almost did it tonight <laughs> anybody can crash a car but 
not everybody can make it cinematic. Not everybody can make it a contribution to a movie. And that's that's what stuntmen and women do. Well, speaking of contributions, uh, your book is organized chronologically. Each chapter focuses on a groundbreaking film that set the standard in some way for future work. Uh, films like Safety, Last, Hell's Angels, uh, one of our favorites, Blues Brothers, obviously set the bar for every car chase to follow. Could you talk about two or three things that stand out in your mind as far as innovations uh, over the over the years and over the course of the years covered in your book? Yeah, I, you know, I would say that without getting too technical, I, I would keep it, I, what I would love to say is, I'd love to keep it more broad in terms of what those innovations could be. One thing that comes to mind is imagination. When you have a former rodeo champion by the name of Yakima Kanut, who made his name uh, becoming a champion rodeo rider, known, known the world over. Uh, when he was hired to create the stunts for John Ford in 1939's Stagecoach, it took a really keen imagination to say, you know what would be really cool is to have John Wayne's character jump off of a moving stagecoach onto the lead horses and try to commandeer and try to take control of that stagecoach. It would also be cool to have one of the marauding Apaches who are chasing after that stagecoach jump off a horse, jump off onto that same lead of horses, get shot, and then fall between the horses and get dragged underneath. This is something that did not occur to John Ford nor to the screenwriters, but it occurred to, to Yakima Kanut, who thought that I can do this. This is something that I that I can manufacture, that I can engineer, and do it in a way that contributes to the story in such a way that it's it's something that people are going to leave the theater talking about. And, and, and it's that kind of thinking that the best stunts in movie history have, have done. They've, they've done things that people hadn't thought of before. And, and that's, that's something that I think a lot of stunt work doesn't often get credit for, is bringing something new to the table and expanding the spectacle and the wonderment of what, what movie telling can be. The other thing I would say is in terms of innovation, um, you know, with changes of technology, stunt professionals have always been able to meet the moment of, of being able to take changes in technology and, and machinery and innovation and kind of conform it to what they can do with stunts in the movies. Case in point, you know, by, you know, with the aforementioned stagecoach, that was sort of the bread and butter for stunt professionals throughout much of the golden era of Hollywood uh, in Westerns. It was with horse based stunt work that a lot of the stunt pro pros specialized in. But with the uh, demise, or I should not the demise because the Western is still with us, but I, I would say with the, with the, um, the drop in popularity of Westerns in the 60s and, and into the 70s, there became less and less opportunities for those stuntmen and women who specialized in horses and in doing stunts with horses and doing stunts in Westerns to ply their trade. And so they were able to innovate and take advantage of the changes in automotive technology with the advances of um, in cars, uh, with the uh, with the changes not only in the how the cars were made, but also in how they were able to go a lot faster. And <laughs> right. so a lot of these a lot of these stuntmen and women were able to pivot and started to concentrate on how to create stunts with cars. And so by the late sixties and into the seventies. I think that's a large part of why you had so much vehicular stunt work that began with in 68 with Bullet and into 71 with uh, the French Connection, Seven Ups, Dirty Mary, Crazy Larry, and so many other films in the 70s. From the, from the horse to the horseless carriage to horsepower. That's right. That's right. They were, so so it's, it's their ability to adapt that I think that it's an element of, of stunt work that I feel 
has had so much impact. And I mean, and it gets into I'm, something I'm sure that you would probably want to talk about, and that is with the advent of CGI. Stunt professionals have been able to adapt with, with CGI and with digital technology in such a way that I think they've embraced it. And they've, they have been able to use digital technology in, a, in such a way that they can do things now that they probably weren't able to do in the 70s. Uh, one of the films I write about, uh, Death Proof, Quentin Tarantino's film, this is a just an absolutely drop dead amazing film uh, for for stunt work. When you have the Kiwi stunt woman Zoe Bell on the hood of a car driving at real speeds of seventy miles an hour or more, and she is she is liter she is literally on the hood of this car going that fast. But because of digital technology, they are able to remove in post the safety tether that has her secured to the hood of the car. It's not that she was totally divorced from danger because if that car, if the driver had lost control of the car, that safety tether would, would be meaningless. So there's still danger. There's still an element of risk involved, but because the stunt community, you know, use a CGI in a way that contributes to their own craft. That's what I, I just, I think it's worth celebrating. I mean, it's, God, these guys are great, man. I just, I can't, <laughs> I, you can tell I'm getting so effusive about it. I, I just get so excited <laughs> and so, and so impressed and in awe of what, of what these guys, what these uh, men and women do. So imagination and adaptability are the, are the two uh, biggest things. And, and speaking of that, you mentioned C and CG, that actually does lead us into our next question. Over the years, you've had, uh, you know, still have some actors doing their own stunts, but you've had stuntmen that look nothing like the actor that they're doubling for. That's it's obviously it's obvious it's a stuntman. You have, then you get into this era where it actually the the stuntmen look a lot like the the actors that they're uh, they're acting for. Uh, now we're moving into the CGI. We're also seeing kind of the advent of almost animatronic figures doing stunts um i recently saw a uh i was at a, a theme park where they had a spider-man do a uh, a stunt going from one building to the other look just like a person mm -hmm. um so obviously to your point the industry keeps changing and evolving what does the future look like and is there i assume there will always be a place for human stunt people but do you see kind of a mixture of, of more of these, you know, animatronic or more digital things being done. What do you see for the future of, of stunt work? Well, I, I know that, I know of that uh, Spider-Man uh, thing. I think it's at, I think it's at Disney, Disney World or Disneyland. Disneyland, yeah. And I, I, I haven't seen it. I've seen a video of it. I'd be very interested to see it. I love, I love the MCU. Here's what I would say. There is a place, I'm sure, for, the introduction of animatronic technology and in, in the creation of some of these uh, stunt sequences in the future. And, and they can, I'm sure, manufacture these robots, for uh, lack of a better word, uh, in such a way that they look human and that they move human-like. But at the end of the day, they're still going to need human beings because I think that there is, you know, what is it called? The uncanny valley where you, the, the human mind or the eyeball can just tell whether or not something looks real, something looks human, which is related to the CGI. You know, when you think back to um, the uh, Rogue One, the Star Wars film, when you had Princess Leia appear at the end of the film, and it's a digital recreation of Carrie Fisher. It looks pretty good, but it ain't Carrie Fisher. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's something, it just doesn't quite work. Now, CGI might get there, but it's not there yet. And I would say that when it comes to the movement of the human body, I think that the viewer, the audience is going to be able to tell the difference. And 
when they can no longer suspend disbelief, I think that they're going to know that this isn't real. And when they know it's not real, it takes them out of the moment. It takes them out of the movie. And I, I want to I want to give a, a a very concise example of this, going back to Raiders of the Lost Ark. When Indiana Jones gets thrown out of the the truck and uh, is hanging on for dear life at the front of the truck, and then goes underneath the truck and is dragged behind the truck, uh, that was a stuntman named Terry Leonard doing that, and. There is something about seeing a human being <laughs> getting dragged underneath a truck that makes people, they, they, they feel more committed to the character. They want to believe. They know that's Indiana Jones. They care more because they know it's an actual person. Cut to Indiana Jones and the, temp, and the um, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. There was... A, an abundance of CGI in that film. And when you see uh, Shia LaBeouf swinging through the jungle on a vine and you know it's digital, you know it's CGI, you just don't care. You don't care what's happening. And I would say about Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, the best scene, the best sequence of that entire movie from a stunt work standpoint was the motorcycle race through the college campus because it was real. There was an actual motorcycle and actual riders driving through that campus. And that was, that was Indiana Jones. That was, that was what the Indiana Jones that you saw in Raiders and Temple of Doom and Last Crusade. Mm -hmm. But the rest, the other sequences just didn't work for, for me because you don't believe it as good as it some of the CGI is, you just don't buy it. So I think there's a, there's a place for animatronic technology, but it's going to be in a way that it's going to be integrated with actual human beings. So what you're saying is we're a long way away from Westworld. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, it's definitely, I definitely think so, yeah. Well, let's go back to a few years prior to the CGI controversy and talk about your other role. Uh, we're big fans of TCM here, and you're going to be programming the upcoming TCM Classic Film Festival and the Classic Cruise. Uh, first question, how does it feel to be back in person this year and back on the water later this year with everybody? Absolutely sublime. I'll bet. Yeah, I, I, we, had a, we had a big meeting um, a couple of weeks ago, and... Every one of us, and we ha we have a big we had any any time in the future we we have a festival we have a big powwow with all the all the uh, different departments and movers and shakers of, the, of putting it all together. And after two and a half three years, we all introduced ourselves to each other, and I I frankly got a little emotional because it first of all we not just not just having been able to see a lot of these people but just getting together and putting on a show again it was right. it's it's um <laughs> it's it's a privilege and i a lot of the people everybody really knows that it's a privilege and to to be able to do it after such a long absence um it's it's extremely meaningful and i've been with tcm 20 two years and um i i still can't quite believe i work here but it's it but in terms of in terms of the programming for the festival i i i work with two other people uh my boss charlie tabish who's a senior vp of programming for tcm and uh, uh stephanie thames who's uh, uh also a director of programming uh the three of us we we put together the festival um, in terms of what the theme is, what the major films are, uh, and then we work closely with our talent team to uh, come up with who the special guests might be. And a lot of the a lot of the guests that we have inform a lot of the choices that we make in terms of the program. So that's kind of a, just a, a thumbnail sketch of how we all put it together. 
I have to be honest, I can't, I don't really have much to say about the cruise yet because uh, we haven't started work on it. The festival is April 21st through the 24th, and we will start on the cruise work on April 25th. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, no rest for the weary. So, huh? we, we don't, yeah, we, we just haven't devoted a lot of time to it yet. But when we do, it, it will be, yeah, all hands on deck and it'll be a labor of love. Well, you've got some big guests coming this year. We saw uh, Steven Spielberg among uh, a bunch of others. So it sounds like it's going to be a wonderful way to get back into the the in-person festival. TCM has such a vast library of of films uh, and um, other collections of of media. How, how do you make the the decision? I know you 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 have a, a process, but from a ph- overall philosophy, do you are you driven by films that people have heard of before, popular films, or sometimes you try to go for some obscure things. Uh, What's the general philosophy there? I would say that we start off, we start first with the theme. Stephanie and and Charlie and I, we, we kind of bandy, you know, back and forth about what our, our overall theme could be. And once we get a consensus on what the theme is, uh, then we we build off from there, and then after we come up with a theme, then we talk about some significant uh, anniversaries, as well as significant restorations. We work very very closely with uh, archives and studios to highlight and to showcase on their behalf their the restorations of the films that they're working on. This festival could not exist really without people at the archives and the studios that are working on their library films, the Academy, uh, the Library of Congress, UCLA, MoMA, uh, our friends at Universal and Paramount, I mean, and so on and so forth. Again, it's our privilege to showcase their work that they're doing on behalf of cinema history. And so when they have a significant restoration that they're working on, and, and it's something that you know that they agree that we could that we that we can borrow to show at the festival that's a major component to what we do to what we do each year so i would say that there's a lot of uh tent poles that fall into place the theme the the major talent uh the restorations the anniversaries and then after that it's kind of um there's there's no real chemistry or uh, not chemistry, but uh, algebra involved. It's really more of a gut instinct from a programmer standpoint. You know, we, uh, we try to create an event that our pass holders are going to remember and that they're going to respond to in a way that it's like, it's something that they just can't miss. Like, for example, one thing that we've got is it's a restoration from UCLA of a film noir called I, the Jury. And it's in 3D. And this is a, a very important restoration that UCL, UCLA has worked on. And for us to, to show this uh, to our to the fans, to the pass holders in 3D, that's something that you're not going to be able to see at home. And to, so to provide those kind of experiences, that that's the kind of thing that, that those are the kind of things that we look for outside of those tentpole events. And I hate to use that word tentpole, but you know, the sort of the major pillars of what, what the festival uh, happened. Uh, and there's so many other things, excuse me, a lot of things that we do in, in Club TCM. A lot of those things, they come later on in the programming planning. And a lot of them are related to the films that we have. So, for example, with our special tributes to Bruce Dern and Piper Laurie and, and uh, animator uh, Floyd Norman, you know, we have conversations we, with each of those guests in Club TCM, and that's another major component of, of what of what people love to see at the festival. So I, I don't know if we would call it a, a philosophy because we just we we try. You know, TCM is not just about old movies. I, I think that's kind of a misnomer about what TCM is all, all about. What we have tried to do is become the destination for the movies. And when it comes to the festival, you will have films not only from the silent era, 
you will have many films from the 1930s, including a lot of pre-codes, uh, Baby Face and uh, Evenings for Sale and Counselor at Law and many others. But then into the 40s and 50s and 60s and into the 70s. But we also celebrate films from the, that were released in the past 30 years or even 20 years. And so it's a matter of celebrating the movies, not just old movies, movies that I think people respond to and, pe and people care about. You know, one of the films that we're showing at the festival this year is the 30th anniversary of uh, a, Le a League of Their Own from 1992. <laughs> this, was a, this was a big movie in 1992. And it, it's a movie that people love and people really, really respond to still. And man, it's such a great film. And so for us to, for us to have a reunion for many of the cast members uh, and to celebrate its anniversary, that's something that that's right in line with what TCM does. That's definitely one of the most quotable, quoted movies in our house. No crying in baseball. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going to be an uh, incredible event, April 21st through 24th of this year coming up. Uh, more info at filmfestival.tcm.com. Scott, your book is Danger on the Silver Screen, and uh, we'd like to find out what's next. Well, we know what's next for you. <laughs> you get a busy summer. Uh, but how can folks keep up to uh, with uh, with what you're up to and any new projects you have coming up? Um, I, I'm on. I'm very active on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at J uh, Scott McGee. And uh, after, I mean, after celebrating the release of this book, um, you know, I'll do some press. And, and uh, one of the things that I do every year is I introduce films and interview guests at another festival in El Paso, Texas. It's called the Plaza Classic Film Festival. It's in August. And so I've been a, I've been a featured speaker there for many years now. And that'll probably be my next thing. That'll be in August. And then after that, yeah, it'll be the, it'll be the cruise uh, in the fall. Well, we've sure enjoyed the book, and uh, it's going to go right up on the shelf next to Jeremy Arnold's and so many of our other friends and past guests we've had on from TCM. So we'll look forward to keeping up with the Film Fest. And, uh, man, appreciate your time uh, today talking about stunts, talking about old movies, new movies, movies we love. Well, thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. Our pleasure. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Scott. Thank you again to our guest, Senior Director of Original Productions at Turner Classic Movies and author of Danger on the Silver Screen, 50 Films Celebrating Cinema's Greatest Stunts, Scott McGee. You can follow him on Twitter at at jscottmcgee and find his book on Amazon and Target.com. And for more information on the Turner Classic Movies Film Festival coming up in April, visit filmfestival.tcm.com. If you enjoyed episode 59, please make sure to follow us and share the podcast with a friend or two. Tell them to check out our new website at heilmanandhaver.com and tune in on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Audible, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Pandora. And you can keep up with all our latest on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram and check out special segments like Get to Know a Theater, In the Mix, and Artist Interviews on YouTube. As always, thank you for supporting your local theater and for joining us here on Heilman & Haver. 